Welcome everyone. My name is Stacy Parker and I am a Gateways horticulturist with the Arboretum and Public Garden. And I am thrilled to be partnering with the staff and faculty health and well-being, as well as each Aggie Matters, Healthy UC Davis, to be bringing you this wonderful program today with our incredibly uh, fabulous photographers, campus photographers, Gregory Urquiaga and Karen Higgins. Um, they have given programs to my students and I um, very ungraciously begged them to do this again for you all because it is so fabulous. And our students' photos, even though they are like the generation of photo taking and being online, I, I have to say there has been a, an incredible difference in the quality of the photos that they have uh, been doing. They, as, as one of their assignments, they have a weekly Instagram post and I'm thrilled to report that they are very inspiring and beautiful and you can actually see the teachings um, show up in, in their photos. So it's, it's fabulous. So um, I will stop going on and on. I will say I'm going to be monitoring the chat for your questions. Um, I, Karen and Gregory um, are, are willing to take them as, as they come along. Is that right, Karen and Gregory? Correct. Okay, so, um, so that's how we'll proceed. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to them. So welcome everyone and thank you so much. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Karen, um, I'm gonna start. And um, I just wanted to say hi. Um, Greg and I are the two um, photographers um, in the strategic communications department on campus. So I just wanted to quickly explain a little bit about what that means and what we do. Um, we, um, we basically um, take pictures for our department and for the campus as a whole. And we manage a um, photo database that anybody can access. Um, the URL is um, photos.ucdavis.edu. So if you are interested in um, looking at, at the pictures or um, downloading any pictures, you can go there and make a, um, an account. Um, we shoot photos um, for assignments for different publications on campus and websites and social media sites. But um, we also um, are just go out and take pictures, do a lot of self-assigning um, to populate our photo collection and just sort of anticipate what our graphic designers and other people on campus um, need. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, Greg's going to talk, um, introduce himself and talk a little bit about his background and I'll do the same. Hello everyone. I'm a, uh, wow, I must be a photographer for 25 years now. And the, the photography in essence is the art of minimalism. So no matter what you're shooting, whether it's people, landscapes, animals, um, you're trying to include only the information that you are really needing. And as a student photographer, I, start, I graduated from SF San Francisco State and um, in journalism and journalism really teaches you, you have to be quick and be able to read something very quickly to understand it, right? For the general readership. And as I've gone on through the years, I've realized that that works for pretty much everything in photography. People have to be able to read it quickly and then whatever else is in the background is, depth and adds more information but there needs to be by you as a photographer a choice made so that you are telling something about whatever you're shooting whether it's contrast of color or uh, one single white tree it is all about choices and what you are trying to say in the visual image and that is what both Karen and I do. With our years of photography, it's become easier for us to figure out how to say something and how to do it quickly and, and, and consistently. And as student photographers or as novice photographers, 
you're trying to develop that voice and figure out how do I shoot whatever it is, a animal or like, like animals are, are wonderful as in that they always make great photos, but really it's about your setup and where you stand so that whatever picture you take of that animal or the nature, the thing of nature, that the background doesn't distract from what you are trying to photograph and say. I almost forgot to unmute myself. Um, so um, I'm, as I said before, I'm Karen. Um, I've been on campus for um, 15 years. I came here um, shortly after graduate school. I um, attended UC Santa Barbara, and then I um, went to graduate school at San Jose State. And I have a similar background to Gregory. I studied photojournalism um, and mass communications and worked in newspapers for a while. Um, I landed here on campus and um, really enjoy um, my work here. Every day is a little bit different and I just really love um, storytelling and the university just has so many different, so many interesting projects and people to meet. And I, um, one of the things I really love about my job is I feel like I'm, I learn something new every day. So um, it's just a good place to be. As I, I should have mentioned earlier, um, Greg and I, um, with the work that we do, we're based on campus, but we also um, get out and about to, depending on our assignments. So, um, you know, that might be the Bay Area or Sacramento, but sometimes um, it's out of state or we're up in Tahoe or Bodega. So we, um, we, we see a lot of different environments and um, a lot of our work usually isn't um, fully focused on a landscape or nature. It's really about the relationship that people have with those environments or a lot of the work that we're doing is showing, um, is about education and about um, research in the landscapes or in the environments. So you'll see, um, actually maybe I should, I'll start showing some pictures here. I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna to try to talk and show pictures, which might not be the best thing for me. <laughs> um, so you'll, you'll just, you'll notice um, a lot of our work um, has people in it, or we might be focusing on um, some of the, um, the creatures or the wildlife that lives in the environments that we're photographing or, um, you know, and that might, might, that might deal with um, the creatures that are there, like ducks and birds and squirrels, but even some of the insects, um, which is just really interesting. But we're also looking at these places and, and, um, and we might be crafting messages or trying to illustrate what these landscapes um, mean to us or mean to the people in them. So um, Greg, feel free to chime in, but um, I was just kind of making a list um, in thinking about campus, but also this could relate to all sorts of environments, whatever environment that you're photographing. And um, a lot of these landscapes are, as I mentioned, places for um, like a, like the Arboretum says that they're a learning lab and they're, they're an extension of um, the classroom, but they're also a place for rest, um, refuge, recreation, um, all, sor all sorts of things, um, social places. So those are just things that we're, we're always thinking about um, when we're making images. And, and I, I think um, it's important to think about when you're, when you're making an image or looking at images, you know, what's the purpose behind your photo and what, what kind of message are you trying to, um, mm. trying to illustrate? And that might be something as simple as, um, I just want to show that these leaves are really interesting, that I really just want to focus on the color of this flower, or I, or maybe I want to um, say something really profound. It's just, keeping in mind of what, what you're trying to um, say with the picture. Greg, do you have anything to add to that? And visually, um, as human beings, we are always looking for patterns 
or breaks in patterns. So when you're looking at these photos, a lot of times you, what your eye, naturally what your eye goes for is either the pattern or the break in the pattern. So like in a lot of these photos, you'll see there'll be a lot of nature and then there'll be one thing that is kind of the break in the pattern or um, the thing that is most white because naturally your eyes go towards the highlights. So um, for instance, you'll see this white horse is more, is, is uh, be the first thing you see or you'll go to the right side of this frame because that is most light. Um, your eye naturally goes towards the whitest part and then it'll go towards the shade. Um, and again, it's, it's all about patterns or breaks in patterns, especially for large, larger scapes like this and that it makes it easier to read when you can see something that is either a break in pattern or a pattern. I also wanted to mention um, how, I, how I was talking about um, messaging or, or, you know, some sort of message that you're, you're um, hey girls. photographed, but there's also um, um, something to keep in mind is, is your subject. Um, and what, like Greg was talking about, you're using, um, and we're going to get into this a little bit more about some elements of design and, and how, how to craft your image in it image and compose but you also want to be thinking about your subject so um if your subject is this guy in in the middle you know how am i going to to craft my photo so that so that your eye goes to him or um so if you're trying to focus on a ladybug how are you going to um, use different elements to to have your your viewer look at that ladybug and those are those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about here. Um, and there's there are so many. We're, we're just going to be talking about a few of them. So um, there are a lot. We just don't want to overwhelm you. But there's a lot of different ways to do this. So we're we're going to go over um, a, a couple. I think we have seven. We're going to go over seven different um, um, elements to to kind of get you started, and you can practice on your own. And Karen, we also got a question. Um, yeah. It sounds like this will fit really well. It says, can you point out the story you were aiming for or break or break in pattern, et cetera, in these photos? Is there a particular one or um, do you just want us to pick one? Greg, do you want to talk about? Do you, is there um, go back to the, uh, the gleaning where they're all, it's, you, you, it was when you passed over in the very beginning where they're all in the field. Yes. And they're all. Um, there you go. That one? Yes, that one. So the, the pattern here is that, that you have rows and rows of, I think they're cabbage. Um, and so immediately, because it's almost entirely green, what, what your eye immediately goes to are the things that are not green. So you're like, okay, well, I, you immediately understand that it's the pattern is rows and rows. And so then it makes it easier for you to see that there are people in there harvesting the plants. So that makes it much easier for a person to understand what's going on. And the, and the way this is shot is that camera is held above the head and shot down because it's shot in this way, it makes it, it makes the patterns more pronounced versus just holding it like in front of your face. Because, because you're shooting down, you're cleaning up the background. So you still get to see the, the, the forest in the back, but really what you're seeing is the pattern of the crops. And that makes it easier for your viewer to understand what's going on and easier to read. I also want to add for this photo is that, um, so the, the subject of the photo um, is in focus. So, so these adies I, I I'm using my cursor I, I can't I don't know if you can see it, but the two the two women in the foreground um, are are in focus and then you know Greg chose a um, with his settings that he was able to make 
the, um, the people in the background be out of focus. And he also chose to shoot at a perspective so that the people in the background, there's kind of a line of people as they sort of frame um, the, the subject in the foreground. So by, by doing that, by, um, by sort of surrounding them and with, but they don't intersect that line of people is that it, it brings your eye, um, it draws your eye to the subject of the photo. Um, if that makes sense. And we'll see more examples of this when we start breaking down some of these, these specific elements. But um, I, I used to do, my, my um, professor used to have um, our class go through magazines and, and find pictures and kind of break it down, like um, find, find a photo that you find interesting and then, and then really looking at it, really look at it and, and, and see what's going on there. Um, so that you can um, kind of recreate that, or you can you can see what the photographer is is really doing to make to make a successful image. So you can do that with a magazine, or just um, a book, or a photo that your your mom sends you, or you know anything like that. So um, it's just it's it's nice to just sit, really sit and sort of observe and see what's going on here. Um, let's see if there's a gonna pick it, let me scroll through these. I had the thumbnail so small here. Um, well, this one's pretty simple, but um, this has leading lines. It has all sorts of lines um, that lead right to, right to that boat. And, um, and the boat is in focus and um, everything else is out of focus. So the ripples of the water, and, um, and the mountains and the skyline, they all lead right to that subject. So, um, so those are some elements that, um, that I was using, using to, to make a, um, a nice photo. I can't see the, the questions with my screen right now. So feel free to holler some questions out at me or Greg. Um, I'll just, I'm just gonna keep scrolling through here. Um, we're going to start getting into the elements of the photos here in a second, but before we do that, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about all of you and um, and your photography and um, what what you bring to the table. Um, I think it's important to to bring up is that all so all of us are photographers. Um, what's great about this is that we all um, bring something. To the table like we're all say we all went and shot this archery class in front of this building we would all come back with different pictures and that's what's so great about it so um i i think it's important to explore that and to really embrace that and um and when you're out taking pictures is to to challenge yourself and to bring a unique perspective to your photos you know how how am I going to shoot this archery class and make it unique to me? Um, and what, um, how, you know, it'd be terrible if we all came back with the exact same picture. Um, what's so fun about it is that we could all do something different. So um, maybe I'm going to shoot from really far away, or maybe I'm going to shoot really close up, or I'm going to lay on my back and shoot up, or I'm going to climb on something, or um, I'm going to focus on um, hands, or I'm going to focus on somebody's face. There's just, there's just so many things that you can, you can do. So, um, don't worry about trying to be like, um, other people. It's great to look at other people's work, but, but to also think about what, what you bring to the table, what's unique about your photos. All right, let's, um, I, let's, let's jump in Greg and start, um, talking about um, the different elements um, that people can explore. I have um, some folders to show um, examples. So um, Greg is gonna talk about light. And I'm just gonna scroll, scroll through so, some examples. And we also just had another um, question come in. It says, part of my lack of knowledge, how do you how do you put your subject of choice in focus and the rest of the photos blurred? Okay, so your camera, if you have the camera, um, an SLR, what you're doing is using uh, 
the depth of field, the, the numbers on the lens, and the depth of field that goes from 22 to 2.8. And 22 basically is stopping down and that makes, that's expanding your range of what is actually in focus. 2.8 would be something that would basically make the grapes in focus and then everything behind it would, would be out of focus. It, it narrows the depth of field. And if you're using like your cell phone, a lot of the cell phones now come in portrait mode and they are basically doing the same thing that, the, that an SLR would do, would be they're blurring out the background uh, because you're choosing a point that you want to be in focus and then the portrait mode in your camera would blur out the background. I should add that a lot, with a lot of cell phones, you can touch the screen and choose where you want to focus. Okay, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, and so that is the way that you're choosing the depth of field is, is with, through an SLR is with the, uh, the numbers in the camera. And, and in lighting, you're always trying to find um, you're either shooting with the light or against the light. And here in this photo, it's shot against the light because the light is coming from the back and to the side, as you can tell by the highlights. And so the reason those highlights are so white is because this photo is being exposed for the, sh for the shadows. And cameras, every camera, whether it's a phone or it's a SLR, has a, uh, a dynamic range of what it can keep uh, what it can keep in color and what it can keep in shade. So if you're exposing for the shadows here, it cannot keep the highlights, the whites, it cannot keep color there. So it lets those go. But if you switch and you're, sh and you're shooting for the highlights, you, the highlights, which are the white part in this photo, would be perfectly red and pretty, but all the, sh all the things in the shadows would go dark because there's a certain dynamic range that has to be, that the camera, any camera, whether it's phone or SLR can keep. I went and grabbed, I don't know if you can see this. Okay, so here's, here's a cell phone and I have it so that it's, let's see, I'll switch it. Um, okay, so this is, <laughs> This is very strange trying to do. Okay, so I don't know if you can see, but I can, there's like little, there's the, um, my, I have an iPhone. So my iPhone is kind of divided up into one, two, three, um, nine. So I can choose like where I want it to um, focus and where I want it to um, um, get the right exposure just by touching it. So um, that's another thing you should think about is not only, um, do I want it to be in focus, but I want that part of the photo to be exposed. You see how when I touch it, it changes. So this is focusing on the TV, which is really dark. So then it changes my exposure. The rest of the photo is really light. So that's how you can, um, you can play with your cell phone that way. And then also, so this is an SL, SLR camera. Um, you, Greg was talking about depth of field, but you can also, um, on the back of your, this particular camera, which every camera, every SLL camera has this, but you can choose, I, like with my camera, there's this little to toggle switch <laughs> um, right here. And I can, I can move, I can toggle it over and it will, um, it will choose, I can choose where I want things to focus if I'm, if I'm doing autofocus. So then I can put, there'll be like a little square in the viewfinder. And so I can put that on, you know, the face of a person or, or the grapes, and then that will be in focus. And then the rest will, um, um, might not be in focus. So um, those are things to play with and then um, kind of get that down. And then as you advance, you can really start playing with depth of field if you have a, um, an SLR camera. But I feel, I feel like that, that could be more advanced. I don't know, some of you might be there already. We got a couple of advanced type of questions here. So, um, one is, have you embraced the mirrorless technology for your camera of choice? Why or why not? I'm a 
I'm embracing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is a mirrorless camera. Um, um, I don't, right, why did we get mirrorless cameras? Well, <laughs> the, the reason we got mirrorless cameras is because um, we, in our office, we have a video team and oh. they don't want to hear the shutter snap of a uh, camera while they're doing video. So we got mirrorless cameras because they have a silent mode and they can they can shoot photographs through the silent mode, which is basically they're taking still photos on the video mode so that there's no sound made. And that's the reason we got the mirrorless cameras. They work well. They, um, the only problems I really see with the mirrorless cameras are um, if you're trying to do studio photography um, and you're, it, it has some, there's some problem areas with that. It uh, takes a lot of energy because it's it's uh, it's using a lot of battery mode to produce the image that you're seeing. So you go through that much quicker, um, and it does tend to have a delay when you're shooting, unless you're totally active with it all the time. It can have a delay. So if you're shooting animals uh, in nature, then it's not something I would recommend because um, when you're shooting an animal, you really need your camera to be really active while you're using it um, because it can't go to sleep. And there are, there are settings that you can do to make sure the camera doesn't go to sleep in, uh, uh, for a mirrorless camera. But uh, the downside is you're gonna have to switch your batteries all the time because it's never turning off. So th those are things that you want to think about. Again, if if match your camera to what your subject is going to be. So if you're thinking about, well, I have a mirrorless camera, I'm going to go out, I'm going to shoot, you know, animals. Then you probably want to change your settings so that your camera is always active, so that when you actually see the photo that you want, and you're pressing the button, it's not having to cycle up to turn on again. That's excellent. So we have several more questions that have come in and I'm, I'm thinking that maybe <laughs> everybody's so excited. We've got, we could do these questions and then maybe hold them to the end so that you all could get through some of those elements in the content. Would, would that work if we just hit these sure. three questions? Okay. So the first one is, is depth of field same as aperture? Correct. Okay. Next. That's great. That's good. That's, Nice and efficient. Okay, could you touch a little bit on the rule of thirds? How does it affect the composition of the photo? Are there scenarios where it is appropriate to break the rule of thirds in photography? Karen? Well, it's always okay to break the rules. I think it's really important to know the rules. And then um, as you, um, as you know those things, it's always fun to break the rules. Greg and I love to break the rules with photography. <laughs> it's really fun. But um, let's see, the rule of thirds is basically breaking your photo up into, um, into three. So horizontally, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor. So you can, you can break um, your, cam your image into, that it could be your viewfinder or your photo into three this way and then you could do it again horizontally and then the general rule um correct me if i'm wrong greg um is that um you want to put your subject kind of where any of those um those lines intersect um is that right greg Am I yeah i mean basically the rule of thirds is your is again like she said to break the the photo into thirds and you're either placing your subject on the right side, the, the left side. And the idea is, is you're trying to, again, trying to tell the story and make the photo more interesting. And you're always trying to follow the rule, but you're also always trying to follow, find a spot where you can break the rules. So like uh, my professor at one point had always told us, uh, you should never do, you should never photograph somebody where 
their fight where their face is split down the side. So you're only having their face on, you know, just on half of the screen. You shouldn't do that. And then of course this professional photographer comes in and that's all he's doing. He's doing that specifically because he's making a point when he's photographing the person, he has, he's only showing one side of their face and then the background is super important. And, and it was funny because he's like, yeah, you know, it never fails. Every time I tell my students, you never do this. The, the professional photographer I, I invite in always brings the, always bring the thing in that breaks the rule. And that, that is something of, of like, you really wanna follow the rules so that you know what they are and why they work. Because once you know the rules and you, and you can see why they work, then you know how to break them and still make the photo work. I think um, that the rule of thirds is a great way to, um, um, in this, like Greg was saying, there's always exceptions to the rule and it's always great to break the rules because um, it, it still works. But I think in general, when people first start taking pictures, they just, they go out and they hold the, the camera to their face and they just take a picture where they're standing, um, you know, shoulder level, and they center their um, their subject, and they take a picture, and and that's that's okay. But generally, um, things seem to be nicer when they're a little off center, or you, you'll see in most of our photos, um, they're not um, the horizon isn't just right in the middle of the photo. It doesn't it doesn't um, bisect the photo? It's usually um, in one of those. Um, it's usually in one of those thirds of the photo. So there's always there's always exceptions to the rule and sometimes you really want to center something, but in general I'd say um, you don't you don't want to do that because that's that's kind of what everybody does or um, it's usually just more more um, pleasing to the eye to have something a little bit off center. Like here with the with the hummingbird is it's it's just um, I think it would be, it wouldn't be the same photo if it was right in the center. I, I love that it's off center like that. And then also for this photograph, if you notice that the, um, the hummingbird is also in the gap where the plant, where, of the plants. So you have the line of plants, there's a gap, then there's also the hummingbird. So it also helps the person who's viewing the photograph see it and say, oh, see it because it makes the, that, there's the gap, there's the bird, and it's a, in the rule of thirds. Right, this and the pattern. All, all, yes. of, all of these plants just lead your eye to go right here. And this is, we'll talk about this too, this is kind of an element of framing too, because he, Greg photographed this bird and he uses the plants um, and this gap right here to frame the bird. Um, so there's a, and there's a use of color. There's a lot of different things going on here. Okay, well, I think that we can probably combine these last two questions before we hold till the end uh, into because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's uh, recommendations on SLR cameras and which mirrorless camera do you use? Um, for, because everything's digital, um, digital camera these days, you are better off buying the uh, like currently, it's, I have a, a Nikon, was it D810? And the reason being is that because you're essentially buying this, the, the wafer inside the camera and you're buying a small computer. And so when you buy a computer, you're trying to buy the biggest, fastest, most memory. Like if you're buying a laptop, that's what you're looking for. And that's the same thing for the cameras you're buying. So you'll, if you're gonna buy a digital camera, you're better off buying something that has the most, um, the most memory, the biggest file size, because you know, in 20 years, when they're making things that are even bigger and faster, your camera will still be viable and it won't look like it's an old photo camera, like, you know, a, a Nikon D1, in comparison to the new cameras, they look kind of grainy and they look very low resolution compared to the newer cameras. 
Greg has a Nikon and I have a Sony and I think I like his Nikon better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> each each camera's every every camera system operates a little differently. I've always been um, I've always liked Nikon uh, because all for one all the camera lenses fit on all the cameras. There's no change of bayonet system. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, Nikons can really take a beating and I'm not very careful with my cameras. I just like on my shoulders, climbing over things and they bang into stuff. I've broken cameras, but it's taken a long time to break them. <laughs> they take much more punishment than they should. And I'm very bad at that. So I tend to stay with Nikons because I do put a hurting on them. There's a lot of good cameras out there. So <laughs> it's, it's actually kind of hard to keep up. We get a new camera, I don't know, every few years. And whenever we do that, we have to do a bunch of research to see what's the latest and greatest. And then we, um, we usually go and, um, and try them out. And unfortunately right now that's hard to do. Um, but um, I, I always like to kind of get my hands on one before I, before I buy it. All right, so should we talk about light, Greg? Yes. The scroll. All right, so again, we're, we're always looking for um, the, the light, the highlights and the shadows. And so like in this photo, it's, you see the girl, the highlights and it's all shadows. And in the next photo, um, you're getting, this is stopped down to F22 because you can tell because the sun makes that star shape. And that's what you would get if you're shooting at F22. You get lots of depth of field, but anything that's a highlight turns into a star. And again, this is the same thing of the shadow of the person against the highlight of the water. And so again, when you're looking for lighting, you're always looking for highlights and shadows. And then once you become more um, advanced and, and what you're seeing, then you can, you can fine, fine tune it. But right now when you're shooting, whether it's with a phone or an SLR, you're always looking for your highlights and your shadows. And if you're shooting for one or the other, then you get different effects. If you're shooting for highlights, it, it makes the rest of the shadows get darker. If you're shooting for the shadows, it'll make all the highlights get whiter. So when you're looking at these photos, as Karen goes through them, think about that of like highlights and shadows and what the, whoever the photographer is, what they're shooting for. Hey, Greg, can you um, mention a little bit about quality of light um, in terms of, well, I guess I, or I yeah. can say, um, I just wanted to, to say, um, just start paying attention to the light um, at different times of day. Um, generally, the light is most beautiful, you know, early in the day or towards the end of the day. Um, and, but I would just start paying attention to, um, you know, the light outside or even, even how the light um, comes into your house through the windows at different kinds of times of day. And, and, um, and, and whether you're outside and you're, the sun or you have shade or you have cloud cover, but also in your house and whether you have the blinds open or you have curtains and just, 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 just start noticing what the light is doing and, and, and why the light is that way, because that's gonna, um, that's gonna um, help you with your, with your photography because photography is all about light. Yeah, and one of my early teachers had us go to the museum to look at some of the, um, the great masters, uh, because they basically, all their paintings have light that is from the side. And that light is usually, if you're shooting photography, in the mornings or in the late day. And so when you go out, if you're like looking at the great masters and their paintings, pay attention to the light and the direction that it's going. And that is something that you're trying to, you're trying to emulate in your photographs. And like, well, how do I get it? When do I get it? And when you start paying attention to the light, then you see like, okay, this is how I can, how I can photograph. Like this photograph, both of the, both of the photographs that are, um, are the, uh, the sunflower are high noon and the light is coming directly from above. So then it's like, well, 
how can you use which high noon is definitely not the best light. It makes everybody look like a raccoon. You get hollow, dark circles in the eyes. And, and so if you're shooting nature, it's like, well, okay, well, how do I do it so that it makes it look interesting? So then in this one, there's a, the shaft of light was coming through and hitting the flower. And so because I'm exposing for the highlights, which are the highlights on the, on the petals, that makes the rest of everything that was in the shadows, which is supposed to be trees in the background, just go black because I'm exposing for the highlights on the plant. And that makes everything else go, go black. This is again, what I'm talking about when I talked about dynamic range. There's only so much your camera can, can hold in, 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 its, you know, in its information banks. So if I exposed for the, the trees that were actually in the background, this flower would be totally white. There would be, you wouldn't, it would just be glowing white. And again, for this, that's the same thing for the, for the other one. This is a, a high noon and it's exposing for the shadows in this plant. And you're, you're just holding the camera and you're like, well, you know, to make it more interesting, I'll get some sun flare in the back. And that, that is, again, you're just paying attention to where the light is and how you as the photographer can make best use of it. I think these two photos are a great example of one of the other elements we're gonna talk about, which is perspective. Um, and I just, I just wanna to, want to show you, and I've done this a little bit in some of our examples, is showing you the same subject matter or that these photos were taken on the same shoot. Uh, no, actually they're taking a couple days apart. But, um, but um, you can shoot the same thing and how do you make it different? And it's all about the choices that you make, what lens you're using, how close you are to the subject. Um, if you put the light behind, like this, this, this photo has the light, the sun um, peeking out behind the flower. Um, and this is, this is like Greg was saying, I'm looking for a shaft of light. So, um, you can't, you're not necessarily able to move the flower because it's growing out of the ground, but you can move yourself and you can totally change the picture by moving and trying different things. And with that in point, it's as if you're like really trying to push your bound boundaries of like what you see, that is a great thing to choose is to, to go find a plant, find a tree, whatever it is, and take your photograph and then once you do it you're you're like okay that was great then stop and think like okay well how else can i shoot this tree to be different and and there are many different ways to do it the point is is that you're trying to force yourself to see in a different way and once you start forcing yourself to to look at different perspectives of the same thing that you're shooting then it carries over into other things that you're shooting. It makes it easier for you to shoot those things as well. Well, and the next element we're talking about is perspective. <laughs> so the photos that I put in here um, um, are shot a bunch of different ways. So um, just like Greg was saying, like this is, this is a tree and like the little seedlings coming up, but um, most people would just come and take a picture of the tree and not even notice this little detail. And, um, and you can, I think as photographers, we're, we're um, observers and we're patient and we, and we really look around and, and notice these details and, and, um, and we can, um, by, make, by the choices we make, we can really um, bring attention to these things. So um, this is a totally different way of shooting this tree. And I think by having you know, this little seedling below, um, you might not really know what it is, but when you see the, the out of focus tree behind it, it makes sense. So you're making some decisions here um, to, to, to give that message. Um, this was shot from a cherry picker and um, I, I, I think I have another roundabout. Oh yeah, another roundabout. This is the same exact roundabout but the photos are totally different. So it, that's just about, you know, getting this one's shot low to the ground and this other one is shot from above. And um, 
they're just, they're both really interesting, but they're totally different. So um, I always have a cherry picker around to do this, but um, you'll notice that Greg and I like to climb on things a lot and we're always like rolling around in the grass or in the dirt. We have leaves in our hair because we're, um, and I think that's part of the reason I love my job. I I'm, I'm feel like I'm still a kid. I get to um, get dirty and, and get down in it. And I just find that really satisfying. And um, I love making images from um, laying on the ground or getting up um, above because it's different than what other people see on a regular basis. Um, so th these are these are scenes from, uh, a lot of them are from on campus. And, um, you know, by choosing your perspective here, um, you're able to, this, this photo is obviously taking at UC Davis. I mean, you, you have um, the water tower there, which is unmistakable, but then we're also saying something about um, the vineyard there. So this, this could easily have been shot with not showing the water tower, but um, the photographer, um, you know, got down low and made sure that they included that water tower, but also got the, the um, vineyard there. So you, it's all about your perspective and the choices that you're making. Same here, this is, you know, really shallow depth of field and really focusing on the, um, the flower blossoms um, rather than the, the entire orchard. And I encourage you, I think Greg and I come from um, journalism school where we've really been trained to go out and shoot in an assignment or a, or a subject and think about it as a story. So <clears throat> we rarely go out and just take one picture or take a picture of something the same way. Um, we're thinking about a story. So we, in, in, in the elements of storytelling, visually um, storytelling, is we want to um, shoot, do a, a wide shot. Like this is, this is definitely a wide shot, shot because it gives you context to what you're shooting and you see the environment. Um, and then we might do a medium shot. These aren't necessarily related, but something that's, that's closer in um, and then we're also shooting details, which are really close up because together all of those photos are telling a story. We, not, we might not publish all of those photos together, but we are always thinking that way because we never know when um, a photo to, to go take pictures of cherry blossom will turn into, oh, you know what? We've decided we have room for, for five pictures. Um, what do you got? And so we are always thinking that way. We always want to have a, have, um, when, when they say they want more photos, we want to always be able to provide that because that's exciting. Um, but the, these are more um, pictures in the, in the Arboretum and just, you know, making choices to, to focus on this woman here, but also see that there's these other people in the, in the um, background and she's in focus and she's framed. And we'll talk more about um, framing, shooting from a low angle here so that you get the bikes, but also the, the beautiful fall colors. Um, this, I think this photo is really interesting. Greg took it and, um, you know, he's focusing on um, the birds. I know everybody's has probably familiar over by the, the bypass. I'm always so fascinated with the bird formations that fly. They're just hypnotizing and I always want to photograph them, but I think Greg did a good job um, capturing that here. You feel like you're in the water here. So, um, you know, making some choices. You can shoot from above, you can shoot this angle. You could actually um, get in the water and, and have your camera partially submerged with the proper equipment, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, so I'm realizing it's 12.58. We have two minutes oh. left. I know, time flies. And you, you can't even imagine your fan base in the chat. Um, there are so many questions and people are just also offering up a lot of appreciation and really um, what, just uh, nice compliments too. And uh, even suggestions for, do you have a photo walk? Did you have a photo walk in the past? Can, can the participants here follow through with a hands-on shooting workshop in 2021? So we've got some future planners here. Um, we also have lots of questions around um, any photo apps you recommend for editing photos. I take a lot of photos of my kid and do you Photoshop your photos and any Photoshop workshops you can or will offer? So for like Photoshop, uh, 
all of our photos do go through Photoshop, um, but we as Karen and I as photojournalists generally do not um, do too much Photoshopping uh, of the photos in that we do what you could do in a dark room. Um, we adjust the highlights and the, uh, the, sh the shadows. Um, we, we, we burn and dodge, um, but we don't do a lot of the things that you would see a lot of the Photoshop, um, Photoshop stuff that you would see on, um, you know, Instagram, for instance, because a lot of the stuff we do goes out into our dam and people need to be able to take it and use it without it being too tricked out, right? You know, super saturated, um, just, it, it has to be for the general public so that even if that's something we prefer to do with our own photographs, that's not something we do for the stuff at work because it needs to be able to go out for publication so that if a designer gets it and they wanna do super saturated photographs and they can do it without having to undo work that we did of like, oh, I'm gonna saturate it. That's just uh, one of the, the things we do for our Photoshop. As for uh, editing, uh, we use Bridge. Uh, there's also something called Photo Mechanic um, that uh, a lot of people use. Um, Bridge is part of the Adobe um, Creative Suite. Yeah. So you know. But oh, yeah, we like Lightroom. Oh yeah. Yes. Great too. Yeah. And it really depends Perfect. on what, well, what you get I, most no, comfortable with. But I think, oh, I was just going to say it's 101. We've, okay. we have come to the end of this wonderful session. I think people would want, uh, definitely want more. There are people that were making um, suggestions for like multi-part series. <laughs> anyway, this is always a treat. And there's a lot of people who have talked about um, just the effect of seeing all these beautiful photos has made them feel more calm and peaceful. And they appreciate all of your knowledge and for sharing all of these beautiful photos. And there's lots and lots of thanks in here. So. I wanna thank you both so much. I feel like we will definitely be hitting you up for a repeat on this because I, I think that people got a lot out of it and it's and I know I always do. I feel like it was it's it's just absolutely wonderful. So thank you so, so much for helping us to introduce yet another vehicle for people to enjoy and connect with uh, the healing power of nature and um, and this is just one way in which you can do that. And next week, we will be having Marlene Simon from the Botanical Conservatory um, talk about 10 easy house plants to grow. And the following week, we'll end up our series with Japanese flower arranging, which is also a treat. So um, thank you all for attending today. And extra special thank you to Karen and Greg. Thank you. Thank you. I want to encourage you all to, um, to go take pictures and especially during this weird time, um, document it. That's kind of how I'm coping um, is by taking pictures because this is a historical time. So whether, whether it's out in nature, but um, photograph what's, what's going on. That's such Goodbye. a good point. That's such a good point. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.